to Vikings were people too, growing up in the Viking Age. I'm Jeffrey Pierce, a member of the Everett Community College Humanities Alliance Steering Committee. Thank you very much for coming out today to learn more about Viking heritage and to support the humanities at Everett Community College. Thank you to Dr. John Olson and the Everett Community College Foundation for their sponsorship of the Humanities Alliance events, particularly this <coughs> one today. Thank you to Dr. Charles Fisher, Director of the Humanities Alliance, for his ongoing support of these endeavors. Uh, thank you to Ku Moa for making our flyers. Thank you also to our employees in custodial services, conference services, media services, and college advancement for making this event possible today. Today we have two special guests. One will introduce the other. I will let our first special guest introduce himself, and then you will understand why he is introducing our second special guest. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Hoquan Laren. I'm a proud student here at Everett Community College. Pleased to be here today to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Teddy Lyon. Uh, Teddy has been a professor at the University of Washington for 42 years, serving as chair of the department from 1995 until 2010. In 1996, Kong Bottle V of Norway made him a knight of the Royal Norwegian Order of Merit. <laughs> Teddy is the author of four books and numerous scholarly articles. Um, he has recently completed a 500-page revised edition of the Historical Dictionary of Norway, which will be released, uh, published later this year. He has appeared on many TV programs from the Norwegian history, from the History Channel, Talking the Vikings, to the Norwegian Broadcasting Network, discussing the US presidential election. Finally, he's a fascinating person, and it will be a treat to listen to him. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming my father, Professor Emeritus of Scandinavian Studies, the Sveta Amistad Endowed Chair in Norwegian Studies, Tadi Leida. Good uh, morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. What a lovely place. Uh, it's my first time actually on, actually on the Everett Community College campus. That's beautiful. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit a few other places. I live in Seattle, of course, but it, here uh, in the north, the, the Normana Hall over there in, uh, in Everett, a, few, a bunch of Norwegians hang out there from time to time. Um, I um, have been extremely pleased to have been invited by Jeffrey to come to uh, Everett to talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, the Vikings. And I try to give, uh, with this talk, a um, different kind of perspective, a different look, a look that uh, is not commonly referenced with respect to the Vikings. Usually it's the ferocious uh, warrior, uh, fantasy-filled kind of image that they present. The very popular Viking series on uh, the History Channel, season five this year. Um, I watched, I haven't watched all of it, but pretty much through the years, um, but after program three, season one, I realized that it was more fantasy than it was fact. Um, and they did some very interesting things that sort of made me sort of turn upside down. <laughs> um, for example, when Loki built the ship, uh, he put the uh, steering board on the wrong side. Yeah. It's on the left side, not on the right side. Um, and I think that was the point where it lost me. Um, 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 we have the word starboard for the right side of the ship. And that comes from the Norse steerboard, steering board. Steering board is on the right side. The starboard is not on the left side. So um, it, maybe they didn't 
think about it, or maybe they just were looking at a picture reflected in a mirror. Um, but Loki, Loki got it wrong anyway. But the emphasis always, and with even with um, documentaries on the Vikings, where like Nova will talk about the ships or the sword um, or exploration, especially to North America. Um, that, that's a fascinating part of their history, uh, of course. But um, usually it is the uh, war, the violence, the raiding um, that, is, uh, that is presented. When I teach the history of the Vikings at the UW, um, I don't talk about the raiding until we get to week six of a 10-week quarter. I focus the first half on the background, on the society, on Scandinavia, on shipbuilding, on uh, the laws and things like that. Students get a little antsy waiting for the good stuff, <laughs> waiting for the films, the documentaries that, uh, that are part of the program. But by the end of the quarter, they usually appreciate getting a little different picture than just that. The rating. But still, that's kind of a fun part. And a thousand years later, it certainly wasn't a fun part for those who experienced it a thousand, thirteen hundred years ago um, with these uh, hit and run raiders coming ashore out of the blue, out of absolutely nothing. And here they are all of a sudden. Uh, it could have been and certainly was um, extremely frightening um, and deadly for many. Um, so it's not to be made light of, it's, sort of, it's, to, um, it, it's a part of history. They, I, I don't think they were any more violent than many of their contemporaries and even people today. But we do also see humorous sides we, because of their literature, their art, we can see some things deeper in their sort of psychology. Uh, and one of my favorite sort of reactions to the Vikings is, of course, the little character, Hagar. Um, I love his, uh, Dick Brown's uh, sort of take on him, uh, this harassed husband. He's typical, if you're familiar with Scandinavian noir, Nordic noir, the, the crime fiction tradition that's really popular these days, um, the girl with the dragon tattoo and these, these sorts of books. Police procedures, um, gruesome kinds of um, a, a crimes that occur. Um, and usually the policeman is some haggard detective who's got all kinds of family problems and, and uh, it, it drinks too much, and these kinds of things, whether it's Harry Hune or whether it's uh, um, any of them. Um, and so this humorous side, one of my favorite, in fact, of Hagar is where he's um, sitting philosophizing with his buddy um, and, uh, and they're, uh, they're talking, oh, this world will never be peaceful until we all can understand each other. And they said, wouldn't it be great if we all spoke the same language uh, and we could understand each other? He says, yeah. And, we're going to have to teach everyone to speak Norwegian, he writes. Of course, that was the Norwegian version of Hagar that uh, I don't know what they had in the English one. But anyway, we get this. This is the stereotype of, uh, of the Vikings, popular view. We first encounter them uh, on the documentary record uh, in the 8th century. In the year 793, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it begins to be written in the 9th century, in the 880s, when Alfred the Great, King of England, uh, begins to try or begins the process of making his people English, giving them a literate, literary culture and making it common and popular. Uh, and he tra has translated numerous books, um, manuscripts, many from early church fathers like Jerome and, and uh, Augustine um, and uh, philosophical works uh, from the Roman period, um, Boethius um, 
And uh, among these, uh, in addition to, I should say, the um, translation, he has uh, his scribes beginning an annual register, a, an annual account of events, important events in England, or at least events thought to be more important, that are written down usually on a single page in a folio, um, and they end up in translation, um, a paragraph, a long paragraph, maybe a page sometimes, uh, equivalent, or sometimes even shorter, just a few sentences. This is what happened this year. Begins in the 880s, and it goes back to the birth of Christ, and the chronicle sort of begins there. But it becomes contemporary in the 880s, and it continues until 1140, not until after the Norman Conquest. It's in here that in 793, for the year 793, that we meet for the first time uh, the Vikings, a reference to Northmen um, uh, raiding uh, the English coast and attacking a monastery, Linda's Farm. This is a monastery that was built on at Linda's Farm on this holy island off the northeast coast of England. A little later, this is not the monastery the Vikings raided and destroyed. Uh, there was an earlier one, but this is the ruins on the island today. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle introduces us to the Vikings with this quote. There were dreadful signs over the land of Northumbria which terrified the people. There were amazing sheets of lightning. There were whirlwinds and fiery dragons were seen flying in the sky. A great famine soon followed these signs and shortly thereafter on the 8th of January, actually it's June, the mis it's a miscopy somewhere along the line in this uh, manuscript, uh, 8th of January, nobody in their right mind is out in the North Sea. Um, and the references to a famine following and all of that um, um, uh, is, uh, uh, is, or famine preceding is, uh, scholars recognize that as a mistake, that it's like in June. And June is the, 8th of June is the day that generally agreed upon. The inroads of heathen men destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne Island by looting and slaughtering. The, one of the early <coughs> translations of this was rapine and slaughter, R-A-P-I-N. Rapine is a word that sort of disappeared from our vocabulary, but it means to loot, to plunder. Um, and because it's, uh, it's a word that uh, is a sort of older origin and is no longer used, it's often confused with raping. Uh, um, and so the, the Vikings get this reputation of raping and pillaging when in fact it's rapine and pillaging, um, not the uh, sexual um, association. These people, after their entry into the consciousness of Western Europe in the 8th century, um, were around for the next three centuries. Uh, and they essentially, as I say here, they gave an age, a name. We think of the, actually the, uh, the, the, the late 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries as the Viking Age. Um, it's also the Carolingian period in um, European history. The, the beginning of the Viking Age corresponds with the reign of Charlemagne uh, and the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire. And he was crowned in the year 800. Um, the Vikings were just beginning. He was, uh, he was faced with the attacks and, and dealt with them as best he could for the first decade and a half until, until his death uh, in 814. But, um, and, it, and his children, his, his children and his grandchildren and descendants weren't nearly as successful as he. Uh, but there's something unique here that these people these raiders have given this 300-year period uh, the na a name, a period that ends essentially with two spectacular battles um, uh, in England in the year 1066. One of the most um, enduring and uh, important years in British history, um, 1066. 
This uh, time we call the, the Viking Age uh, sees uh, the Scandinavian raiders, uh, settlers, migrants, uh, settling all over uh, Western Europe uh, and into Eastern Europe um, along the Russian river system. Not to the same extent did they settle there as they did in Western Europe, but they are present there and they, they become a strong presence. They leave a significant uh, heritage um, that uh, we still recognize today. Um, even as far away as uh, Constantinople uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. And the balustrade, the upper balcony of San Sofia uh, Church, Cathedral in um, Constantinople, Istanbul today. Uh, there is a graffiti carving uh, in Runic uh, that has uh, a name a name is carved in the marble, and that name is Haldan, Half Dane, a very common name in the Viking Age. Um, it, it's, it's as though some Viking visiting that uh, church, it was a church then, became a mosque. Today it's a museum. Um, but visiting that church uh, up there in the balcony, perhaps listening to a sermon, perhaps just wandering through the church, um, being a tourist, um, but uh, carving his name, Haldun was here. They settled, of course, in um, uh, great numbers uh, in England, uh, in the Northern Isles, that is uh, north of Britain, the northern part of Britain, and uh, the Hebrides, um, Shetland, uh, the Orkneys, and even further north to the Faroes, the Isle of Man, um, the coast of uh, the northern coast of Scotland, uh, and uh, northern England um, to a significant extent, across the North Atlantic to uh, Iceland and Greenland and North America that the Vikings called Vinland, Vinland, or Vinland, whether it's Wineland or Meadowland, um, it's uh, somewhere in the St. Lawrence, or it's that area around the St. Lawrence River estuary um, where the, where the St. Lawrence River runs out into the Atlantic um, and encounters uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island and, and Maine and, and New Brunswick. They also um, are responsible for establishing the first trading centers, uh, trading market towns in Ireland. Ireland is totally agricultural, rural, until the Vikings in 841 establish a uh, port at uh, what uh, on the Liffey River uh, that becomes the city of Dublin. Uh, they are the founders of the, of the urban uh, Ireland. Dublin, Limerick, and Cork are all established. They're all coastal market towns. Dublin becomes actually the major slave emporium in the Viking Age. Um, and and uh, archaeological finds there have shown um, neck, metal neck braces, these uh, uh, with long chains on them that, uh, that were used uh, on, the, on the slaves that were sent in many cases to uh, uh, North Africa or Russia. They were over in the east um, in the river systems leading from the Baltic to the Mediterranean and the Black Seas. Um, the Dnieper River, uh, the Lovat, the Volga, uh, and uh, the new uh, growing state uh, around Kiev that expands gradually. Uh, it takes the name Russia from the name Rus, and Rus was the name for, of the Swedish Vikings. Um, Rus is a, is the, it comes from the word Rus, which means rowers, and the e eastern coast of Sweden from Stockholm north and the island archipelago 
but today is this beautiful uh, natural sort of seaside archipelago of uh, eastern Sweden around Stockholm. Um, is was called Ruslager, the land of the rollers. The Finns called the Swedes Ruotsi, and they still do. That's the name of Swedes in Finnish, Ruotsi. They still use that old word of Rus for the Swedes. And when and it was the Swedes who were common, most prominent and most common in the trading route between the Baltic and the Black Sea down to Constantinople. Although there were Danes, Norwegians, and Anglo-Saxons who did join in, especially after 1066, a lot of Anglo-Saxons left England not wanting to live under the Normans, and they joined the, 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 the Rus and became part, actually, of the Varangian Guard, the uh, elite guard of the, of the Holy Roman Emperor in uh, Constantinople. But these, Swedish traders, these Rus, gave their name to the land of the Rus, which becomes Russia, Russia. So even the country of Russia uh, has in its very name uh, a uh, memorial, I suppose you could say, to, uh, to the Vikings. Even more in English, we don't get the name of our country. We get that from a map maker who made all kinds of mistakes about who discovered the country. Um, but um, we get a lot of words. And interestingly enough, um, we encounter the Vikings four days of the week, really without even realizing it, because four days of the week are named after Norse gods. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Well, Friday, the goddess. Three gods and the goddess. So that we get a, a female deity in there as well. Scholars aren't sure which one of the female deities Friday is named for. It could be Freya, who is the sister of Frey. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the goddess of uh, beauty and fertility. Or it could be Frigg, who is also called Frigg, Frigga, Frigga. Um, when, and it wasn't explained in the 5th century, when they, or 4th century, when they decided on the names of the week, which goddess they chose, but um, she was the wife of uh, Odin. Maybe I should say she is the wife of Odin. Um, Tuesday, the god of war, Tyr. Tyr was a major deity in the early part of the Viking Age. Uh, and in the um, migration period, the time when the days of the week were being determined, the names of them, he was still a major Germanic deity. Uh, Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us that Tyr was uh, the equivalent to Mars, the war, god of war. But by the time we get to the Viking Age, Tyr is not that important. By the time we get to 300 years later in the 8th century, uh, it's, it, 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 he's diminished in stature. We know that from many of the poems. We know it from the, from the literature, certainly from the later saga tradition. But he's, he plays an important role in the establishment of sort of the world, the universe. He has one defined role to play. He, but he's, uh, so he's diminished in stature, but he's still important enough when they're naming the names of the week. So he gets a day named after him, Tuesday. Tyrstad, we say in Scandinavia, the day of Tyr. Wednesday, that's an obvious one. Wotan, the Germanic name, Uden, we say in Scandinavia. Um, and he is uh, often seen as sort of the equivalent of Mercury. And actually, Monday, Monday, Mercury, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, Dimash. You get you get the same gods, just a little different form, different name, but the same type of god, and essentially the same Mercury, Mercury, and Odin, Wednesday, um, Thursday, Thor, who is the equivalent of of, of Jove and uh, Jupiter. Um, 
is, is uh, Thor Thursday and then Friday. So we, in our weekly activity, live with the Vikings, live with the Viking tradition in us. And many of the words, this is just some of the words that come from the Norse into the English. Most of this transfer takes place in the 9th century, 10th century, after the um, sort of migratory mass settlement of the Norse in Northern England, which begins in 878 uh, and, th and thereafter, when that Northern part of England becomes administratively ruled uh, by uh, Danish law and tradition, or Norse law and tradition. <coughs> and these words uh, come into the uh, vocabulary, sometimes replacing uh, Anglo-Saxon words, Old English words, sometimes supplementing. So you get something like, um, in, it enriches the English language in the long run, you get, you get um, a word like valley, the, the, uh, the Old English, and you get the Norse day. And the, uh, they both mean the same thing. In the northern part of England, they often talk about a dale rather than a valley. But we use both words and we understand they mean essentially the same thing. Some replacement takes place with uh, the third person plural. They, them, and there. Uh, they, them, and there. They, they were difficult. This third person plural in the Old English required different words uh, in, and, depending on what the reference was. So, you, so the, there was a case system. So it was of them, by them, for them. You had different words. The Norse had simply one word. They, or them, or there. Um, and the English adopted it. They just simply began using it. That tells you a little bit about the closeness not just of the two languages, Old English and Old Norse were mutually intelligible. They could understand each other. They could live at the same, in the same area. They could live in different parts of the valley. They could speak to each other in their own language and be understood. A little bit like Swedes and Norwegians today or Washingtonians and Oregonians. <laughs> you can understand each other if you want to. At least Huskies and Ducks end up that way these days. And we also have a wonderful document uh, from a little bit later in the Viking period. It actually comes from the later 10th century, nine, around 960, 980. This is, um, uh, I suppose we could say, a manuscript uh, birth certificate for Denmark, maybe. Um, it is a seven foot high, three-sided stone that on which has been carved uh, this remarkable message, as well as several images, um, a Christ figure, a crucifix figure, uh, praying hands, doves, religious symbols. It is um, a carving that was done for, I don't think it was done by the king of Denmark, Harold Bluetooth, but um, it, was, uh, it was done in his name. And it begins, I, Harold, uh, son of Gorm and Kiri, uh, raised this stone in their honor. Um, that same Harold, who conquered Norway and made the Danes Christian. That's his message. It's, uh, it's written on, this is the main face, then on, there's, a, there's a, some on the side here. The writing goes this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. It goes, wraps around, it, it snakes around the stone. But he's telling us of his great authority and great power he conquered Norway. He uh, made the Danes Christian. He is the first of the Nordic Scandinavian monarchs who becomes Christian um, around the year 980. His son, Svein Forkbeard, will be the conqueror of England a couple decades later. And his son, again, is King of England, Knut the Great, um, who 
uh, who rules for much of the 11th century before the Norman Conquest. But a few years ago, uh, a young technology company, just beginning, actually looking for a name. Um, decided, this, this sounded interesting. Uh, apparently one of the people involved in it was Danish and however had some uh, background in, in uh, Viking names, Viking history. I got a phone call one day uh, from a, a, a young man who wanted to talk about this Viking king, Hiram Hutu. Um, and he wanted to know, was he a good guy? Um, is, is, was, what is his reputation? How is he seen by historians? I said, you know, nobody, nobody sued him as far as I know. And he seems to be doing all right. Why, why do you wonder? Well, we're thinking of using his name, but not if it would offend people. Would it offend any Scandinavians? I said, no, I don't think so. You mean Harold? No, 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 I mean Bluetooth. Oh yeah, okay, well, no, I, he was just a king with a rotten tooth. <laughs> uh, and, and he got the by name, which I'll talk a little bit about too, uh, called Bluetooth. Um, and and um, he said, so he wanted to talk about what he did. And he referenced this stone, the message on the stone, uh, about uniting Denmark or uh, con conquering Norway, uniting Norway with Denmark and making the Danes Christian. But it was that un uh, unification of Norway and Denmark that seemed to um, be the point of his uh, call. And uh, we talked probably for 15 minutes. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I was too stupid to ask if I could get on the list of stocks for this company that we were <laughs> starting. But at any rate, left with a story. Next thing I knew, um, this little icon keeps popping up all over the place. <coughs> and, um, you've seen it too, all over, especially on your phone. Um, any um, equipment sort of that connects one to another, this interconnectivity uses what Bluetooth technology. And the name there, where this icon that you see on the right, comes from the first initial of Harald's first and binding, first name of binding. Harald Bluetooth, HB. In the Danish variant of the runic, this is H and that's B. So you put them together and you get the Bluetooth logo. In fact, that very first um, cross, it's, a, it's in that very first character on the stone, um, a, a variant of the H. Um, as I mentioned, I think the, the Vikings were much less violent, or uh, no less violent than their contemporaries. Um, and probably no more so. Uh, from time to time, I suppose, they could be pretty nasty. But when you think about back in 2010, um, a mass grave was found in southern England when the British were building a new road to uh, uh, let people get to an Olympic venue for the Olympics uh, coming up. Um, to Weymouth, from London to Weymouth. And as they were excavating, they uncovered a mass grave. Right, right, where the, right beside where the road was going to be, but it was uncovered. 58 skeletons were found, all of them beheaded. The heads piled in one pile and the bodies lying in another in this grave. It turned out they were young men between the ages of 18 and 30. And they had an, an examination of the teeth showed that they had all grown up in Scandinavia, in Norway and Denmark. 
and they were monkeys, probably, because they dated from the early part of the uh, 11th century. Well, there was a mass killing of Danes, or Vikings, in uh, the year 1003, uh, called the, the uh, uh, St. Bryce's Day Massacre, uh, where King Ethelred the Unready made an um, uh, authorization, a pogrom, to, uh, to, to kill all Danes who had grown up among the light, light chaff among the wheat. Uh, in England, and this may have been part of that massacre. Um, and they've also found mass graves in Oxford and other places in England <coughs> from this period. So they were victims of violence, and they were from Scandinavia. So they were likely Vikings who, for Viking, who had settled North Norse, who had settled in North America, in uh, Southern England, or Northern England, and. Uh, then were eliminated in this uh, pogrom. So that, violence, it's all relative. Who's doing it and to whom? Um, Vikings were un unlikely to be any worse or any better than their contemporaries. But the sources also tell us some interesting things about their sort of attitudes about their uh, living and, and their own uh, views. They were tolerant of other religions. They allowed missionaries, Christian missionaries, to roam around in Scandinavia, not bothering them. There's, a, there's one account of a Viking who is baptized and gets a baptismal gift. And upon receiving the gift, he seems to have been very disappointed because he says, uh, if this is all I get, uh, it's the last time I'm going to be baptized. <laughs> He must have done this a few times. They were extremely um, dedicated to the rule of law. Uh, in fact, the word law comes from the Norse uh, into uh, English. Not that there wasn't law in England before, but the use, that term, the word law. Strong advocates for compromise and societal order. They really wanted society to work and they encouraged compromise. If there was conflict, they tried to work it out. They negotiated. They had negotiators come in and help to negotiate so that both sides could come to some agreement. They were very concerned about their reputation. We find that in much of the poetry. Um, about how important the, the, the perception of the person was. Um, even after death, a good death is one that is remembered. A good person is one who is remembered as a good person. Eternal life is being remembered, not living in some heaven somewhere. And they really seem to care about their appearance. This is a fascinating part that we find um, evidence of in uh, grave excavations. Do you know that the most common artifact found in a Viking grave is a comb? It's like everybody kept a comb in their pocket or in their bag. And this is an example of one. It's made from a bone, a, a ear bone. <coughs> intricate carving, carving. It's, it's not like you insert the teeth into it. You, you have this bone, and you carve the, it's like Michelangelo, uh, right? The, uh, the statue is in the rock, and then you just have to find it. The comb is in the rock, and you have to shave away all of the parts that are extraneous, and you make your comb. But combing your hair is one thing. Looking good, you know, like this guy. This is a carving of a Viking. Look at that beautiful beard and mustache. He's got teeth that you would kill for. He's great. Wonderful guy. Immaculate. This is a car carved head from the Osaberg Viking ship burial, a burial uh, from 834, the, the Viking ship in Oslo, Norway. 
in, um, also found in graves, they have these kinds of things. Um, I don't know if you, you see the little face here and that tiny hand. This is a tiny little thing. This is an earwax remover. <laughs> the chair's not too pointed there, is it? And in the middle of that ivory little stick there is a toothpick. And then, of course, uh, you probably recognize the little piece on the right. That's a tweezer. So you can see you can pluck hair. Tell me they didn't care about how they look when you find stuff like this in, in graves. Of course, throughout Scandinavia, um, we find uh, in the landscape an awful lot of evidence of their everyday life. You would come, you drive around in Sweden, and there are runic stones everywhere. You stop in a town, you go to the visit the church built in the Middle Ages. Now there are rune stones in the cemetery. There are rune stones along the road. Most rune stones actually were carved by Christians, post-Christian. There, there are. It's a minority of stones that are actually from the pagan, pre-Christian period, the early Viking age. But there are many, but most come from the later period. One stone that, that is clearly referencing a pagan uh, story is the one you see on the right. That uh, might, you may recognize that uh, person. Um, holding a hammer, which is the identifying mark for this guy. This is the god Thor. And he seems to be in a boat, you see? And in the water below, a, a snake. This is a clear um, reference to, in pictorial form, a runic picture stone, rather than a runic writing stone. Um, of a um, story um, of Thor fishing for the world snake. The world snake was one of three essences that were the sort of antithesis to the Vikings. They were th their three children <coughs> of um, uh, kind of the dark side of their religious life. There's the world snake, there's the wolf, the feminist wolf, and there is uh, Hel, the guardian of the underworld, all children of Loki. And, and Thor, the, the prophecy is that Thor will fight the world snake in the end, at the final days of, of uh, Ragnarok, um, but he's constantly trying to catch this world snake. And one of the stories, myths if you will, um, tells about uh, him fishing for the world snake. And he has it on a hook, and he's reeling him in. And his foot goes through the bottom of the boat, and he loses the tension, and the snake gets off the, off the uh, uh, line. And you can actually see his foot coming out of the bottom of the boat. So it's that instant in the story when, when Thor loses the, loses the world snake. Or, and this is a, a portal carving, incredibly beautiful art, carved um, in the church that was built uh, in the early Viking period. Uh, it appears, it was placed, it's a large panel, uh, about the size actually of this screen, you can turn it the other way, um, and it's now in the north wall of, the, of a church, state church, the church that you see up at the top of that top left, the Urna State Church. It's in the North Wall. They preserved this old, three old door portals as part of the wall of a new church. Well, that new church was built in 1130, and it still stands. The original church was gone. The one on the top there is in Greenland. That's the cathedral uh, that Leif Erikson, uh, or Eric the Red, I don't think he built it, but maybe his wife. Eric the Red never became Christian. Um, but this was in, built in Greenland. And the bottom center picture is the site uh, of the, uh, uh, the Gulathing, which is the assembly, law assembly, 
in Western Norway and, and a modern construction around that site. But in Scandinavia, the Vikings are everywhere. You encounter them most strongly in Iceland if you take a trip to Iceland, the seven hour flight on Iceland there. That country is fuming with Vikings. And some of you may have seen at the Nordic Museum, the new National Nordic Museum, that Congress just voted them the National Nordic Museum. Um, this was the exhibit that is, I think it's still on this week. Um, it ends this week, I believe. Um, the Vikings begin. This is from uh, Uppsala University, an exhibit of, uh, of Viking artifacts. I don't know if any of you have been able to see it in, in Ballard. They had an extensive trading network all through the Baltic, as I mentioned, down to the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. That's an early um, uh, drawing of uh, Dublin. Of the, of the beginnings of Dublin as a port, and then the walled city of Constantinople, a medieval um, a drawing from, uh, from a medieval manuscript. We glimpse the Viking world most uh, strikingly in their literature, uh, their poetry. Um, the literature primarily comes from the little post-Viking period, but it builds on the memories and traditions from the Viking Age. They're written down in the 12th, from the 12th to the uh, 14th century. Uh, most of the Viking sagas are written in the 13th century in the 1200s. But the poetry is something that is preserved. Poetry, it's, it's a literary genre that, that allows uh, sort of to, to retain the accuracy. Uh, it's not the kind of story that can dissipate and change in the telling and retelling. Poetry is much more solid and firm. And things like the po poems like the Rikstula and the Hovamur, two major poems um, that tell of Viking life. The Rikstula, which tells of the establishment of the class system. Three classes, the thrall, the carl, the jarl, the aristocrat, the slave, and the middle class farmer. Uh, the oldest manuscript we have of it is from 1350, which is very late, of course. Uh, but there are references to aspects of it in other <coughs> poems uh, that we know of earlier. But they suggest certain cultural attitudes that tell us a good bit about Viking culture. The Hovamor is a spectacular poem. It's said to be the poem um, often uh, called the sayings of the high one or Odin. This is advice from Odin. It's um, uh, advice on how to conduct yourself, how to behave. Um, it's not ethical rules. It's not a Ten Commandments or anything like that. It's things like uh, drink your meat but in moderation. Don't, don't, don't drink too much. Talk sense or be silent. What could be better than that? No man is called this so courteous if he goes to bed at an early hour. <coughs> Most famous verse. Actually, there are three, four variants of this same verse in the whole world. Cattle die, kinsmen die, you yourself die. I know one thing that never dies. The judgment of a dead man's life or another variant, a dead man's reputation never dies. That's your eternal life. Cattle die, kinsmen die, you yourself will die. But the one thing that never dies is what people say about you. So don't let them say bad things. <laughs> you know this little boat was found in a grave? This is a little carved Viking. Boat, Viking ship, probably by, you know, by a Viking child. So growing up in Viking Scandinavia, new children, young, uh, being born, young people, uh, there were tr social attitudes and traditions. 
Children were usually welcome. Sometimes not, interestingly enough. Then we, we have a law from Iceland and, and a, a reference in the year 1000, uh, as late as 1000, that children could be exposed. That is put out if they're not accepted at birth. What determined that? Maybe physical condition of the <coughs> child, maybe the deformation. We don't know. Maybe the economic status of the family. It seems not to have been gender uh, determined. Whether boys or girls, girls put out more. No, that wasn't. seems not to have been the case. But it was part of the pagan tradition that they could do that. But once the child is taken to the breast and, and cleaned and clothed, then it becomes a killing. Then it's murder, essentially, to uh, expose a child. The next step, of course, is to baptize, if you will, to give them a name. And there is a kind of a sprinkling ceremony in pagan Scandinavia. Of course, it, it's mirrored by baptism in the Christian tradition. Giving a name, uh, very important. You don't give a name right away. You have to wait until you know what name this child should have. Uh, but some families have certain traditions for naming children. Rhyming names, naming children after uh, grandparents or family members, that sort of thing. <coughs> there were no family names. There were no surnames in Viking Scandinavia. There still are no surnames in Iceland. It's the patronymic. So you are the son or the daughter of <coughs> your father, and you take your father's name, Sven. And you are Sven, and maybe your name will be Gustav. So you become, or let's, let's take an Icelandic name, uh, Raum uh, uh, Svensson, or Raum uh, or Gunnhild Sven's daughter, <coughs> Dottir. So you have daughter or son after your father's name. Of course, in Iceland today, if a single mother can name the child, that will, will have the name after her mother or his mother. Um, that's, that's also. In the, in the tradition. So it's the, not just the patronymic, it's I guess the patronymic as well. <coughs> so names can become a problem because you can have the same name in the same district and you, have to, you, you, you can be confused about who's who. Um, and that may be one of the reasons why we get the development of my names. Uh, but it could also be a literary um, tradition. Because these are names that show up in the sagas, in the literary tradition, in the poetic tradition. Um, they, they, are, they are names that are given for a specific reason, a personal habit, an occupation, some biographical feature perhaps, maybe where the person's from, maybe their temperament. Eric the Red, if you have red hair, maybe that's where it gets it. Titil Flat Nose. I think that's pretty obvious than some sort of facial characteristic. Turfin Skull Splitter, must have been, could well have been a professional warrior. Einar Oyetan, a lawyer? A lawman? <laughs> uh, Harold Fairhair, that's a great, the, the saga tells us where he got his name. Um, um, he wanted to, uh, he courted a, a woman who's, who, re, who refused him, said, you're not important enough. I'm not going to marry just any ordinary person. I, my husband is going to be a king, and that's that. And Harold was then, rather than, rather than being uh, uh, disappointed and, and giving up, he said, okay, if that's what it takes. He vowed that he would never wash or cut his hair until he conquered all of Norway. And that uh, took a few years. Probably a pretty smelly guy. But then when he finally accomplished it, he cut his hair and washed what was left, and he got the name Fair Hair. Or in, in the Old Norse, Hårfag Hair, which means beautiful hair. Um, he's the first of the line of kings uh, in Norway. Toshil Bragger, I don't think you know what he was known for. Grenjolf the Unruly, out the deep minded. This is a wonderful, she is a great character, one of the finest characters in the saga literary tradition. 
She is a, she's a, an explorer, a founder of a dynasty in northern Iceland, fantastic character. In a, in a saga that is probably written by a woman. It's the one saga that is thought to be written by a woman. Lobster uh, um, and, and, and other names like this. Um, these are by names. Common names in the Viking era are names that are probably familiar to you today and, the, and their origins. The unusual in Scandinavia are the names that have to do with animals like wolf and bear. Bear is pretty common, Bjorn, Bjornborg, um, wolf, Ulf, we got a guy on CNN who has that name. Um, Gave, I don't know of any Gaves in North America, but it's common in Scandinavia. It means a spear. Odd, odd, O-D-D, and odd is a peninsula, a spear tip. Um, even a nose. Uh, it, it doesn't work in English, however. My name is Odd. And, uh, uh, so these are common uh, names from the Viking period. Education of, uh, of Vikings growing up, it's done at home. Uh, we have grave uh, uh, finds. Uh, toy games, uh, toy swords, uh, horses, boats, uh, game pieces, boys and girls. Um, according to the Ringstula, this poem, different kinds of training for boys and girls. Girls being taught things around the house, cooking and sewing and food making, and boys outside um, doing physical play, wrestling, learning bow and arrow. Adulthood seems to have come around puberty. Uh, in Swedish law, you could uh, you could own land uh, at 18. At 15, you could not be forced to stay at home. You could uh, there's a, in the saga there's a there's a brother of Saint Olaf who, who wants to join his brother in battle, um, and. Uh, uh, he's only 15. His brother says, no, you can't. You're too young. He says, well, if I'm too young and too weak, you can tie the sword to my hand. I'm going. So he was 15 and he could make, it, make his own decision. Determining a mate, getting married. Sometimes love was involved. We're, we know that from the saga tradition. But very often it's negotiations between families. Sometimes unhappy negotiations for the bride or the groom. Usually the bride is the unhappy one. Um, there's one wonderful story in the uh, Njal saga that tells of Harald uh, who's told that she's going to marry a neighbor boy, and, she, and he says, but I don't love him, I don't want to marry him. And the father says, you're going to? And he says, okay, okay, I'll accept it, but it's not my last marriage. So, and it wasn't. She managed to get it dispatched later. Um, you could divorce, or that was an easy way to get rid of a, a spouse. Um, and there were several reasons that uh, you could use for divorce. Uh, the one that uh, is often referenced in the sagas is this one dressing in the clothes associated with the other sex. So what Hagyaga did, in fact, was to make a blouse, a shirt for her husband that had an open neck. And he put that on, and it was a gotcha moment. He uh, says, you're wearing a woman's garment, and I don't want to be married to you anymore, and so she could divorce him. Um, striking the spouse, male or female, was grounds for divorce. Taking the property outside the, the country uh, could be grounds for divorce. Uh, an Arab a visitor to Scandinavia, to Denmark, wrote how disappointed he was, how upset he was, that it was so easy for women to leave a marriage. Because all they have to do is say they don't want to be married anymore and they can leave. He says, what kind of society is this? But there were formal rules. So it, it had to, the decision to divorce had to be declared in three places. 
at the bedside, at the door threshold, and at the assembly. So it becomes, the bedside is, is proclamation between the two, and then the threshold is the family, and then the assembly is the community. So the, you, the word has to spread that way. We know of a great deal of leisure time. They weren't just always farming, raising food, and, and, war, and being warriors. They, uh, they enjoyed poetry, they enjoyed telling stories, they enjoyed board games, chess pieces found uh, on the Isle of Lewis in 1831, some 99 chess pieces, 90 pieces found uh, that were made of walrus ivory, um, spectacular, beautiful chess pieces. Pipes of Pan, a musical instrument, has been found in York, uh, excavated there. Dancing, uh, dances, uh, the dance tradition in the Pharaohs, especially, is, is recognized as dating back to the Viking Age. They had all kinds of competition, and there are references to competition. Wrestling and fishing and skating and skiing competition. There's one where a Greenlander, a story that tells of a Greenlander and, a, and a, his friend, the Viking, and the Viking challenged his Greenlander friend to competition to shoot a bow, uh, shoot an arrow, and off a cliff and hit a target at the bottom of the cliff, uh, and whoever got the closest would be the winner, and the other would be thrown off the cliff. And the Greenlander said, "No, no, no. I, I value our friendship too much. I don't, we can't do that. One of us will lose, and then one of us will lose a good friend." And the, the Viking, he must have been off. But he insisted, the Greenlander went along, they fired, the Greenlander put it right in the middle of the target. This is a Greenlander story of tradition, of course. And the Viking missed, and so they threw the Viking off the cliff. But nobody felt too badly because it was his own idea. <laughs> so competition comes in many forms. Festivals and rituals, midsummer, midwinter festivals. Many of the festivals sort of morph into Christian ceremonies and festivals, but it's the midsummer and the midwinter that are the two main ones. The half year, the winter half year, October to April, the summer half year, April to October. There develops in Scandinavia a calendar. This is a Primstav. This is a medieval calendar, a way of marking the days. Um, and uh, the Christian church in Scandinavia, and there were symbols associated with holy days. But they may have had something like this as well. The emphasis in the Viking Age, uh, in the literature, and, in, and we see in the tradition, is on the heroic. And, and this, is, this is in their literature, it's in their um, everyday life. Their attitudes, the, the hero, uh, the importance of the hero. And the gods were heroic. Uh, they were heroes writ large, if you will. Whether it was Frey, whether it was Odin, or whether it was Thor. The, this, this religion, this, this concept of heroic that transmits from the life of the gods and the battles that the gods are engaged in to the uh, life uh, among ordinary commoners. Well, we've come, uh, I've been talking an awfully long time, I should uh, sort of think of wrapping this up. Um, just I'll very quickly go through some of the sort of uh, artistic expressions that we see from the Viking Age. Uh, these are brooches that were excavated. They're from, they date from the 9th and 10th centuries. Borda style, that's a uh, part of the area of southeastern Norway where these were found. The Oseberg style, this uh, deep carving, um, uh, this is an animal post head found with the Oseberg ship. And that on the right is a tapestry that was, uh, that was found as part of the Oseberg grave. And of course, the um, a real artistic masterpiece, a shipbuilding. It's, Technology and art and science so all blended together to create this 76 foot long, 15 feet wide, uh, open sailing ship. It's a sailing ship uh, that could be rowed. Uh, there's a mast. The Viking ships had masts, solid masts anchored to the keel of the ship. 
we saw this um, in an earlier slide. This is at the late Viking Age, right at the end of the Viking Age. And you see the animal motif has become quite stylized, but still recognize uh, that uh, the, these are maybe deers or something like that. But this intertwining is common throughout the entire Viking Age. The love of this flourishments and embellishments in the art. Um, so in conclusion, um, while life in the Viking Age uh, was clearly tough and in many ways primitive, um, certainly by modern standards, um, they, uh, their customs, uh, their culture uh, helped shape their lives. They had a strong sense of social responsibility, faith, community cooperation, family relationships were important an aesthetic appreciation of beauty and art, and the spoken word. The spoken word was, was perhaps as treasured as was uh, the art. So we live a thousand years later, but much in their culture is familiar to us. Um, we are their cultural heirs, certainly in uh, North America, obviously in Scandinavia. Their language is an ancestor of our own. In that sense, we share their thoughts and expressions. We talk like they do, a little differently, but the same concepts. Many of their laws are the basis of our laws. The jury system in English common law comes to England from the Vikings. They lived in their world and they imagined many others. They lived in the mythical present, they imagined the mythical past, and they reveled in it, they, they pictured it, they wrote about it, they talked about it, they dreamed of a mythical future. And for us, they are in our language, they are in our cultural DNA. And with that, I say, as we say in Norway, to some talk. Uh, thank you very much. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to take them. Yes, I was wondering why uh, traditional depictions of uh, school and hammer are always upside down. Do you know why that is? Why, well, um, rather than the handle down, and, yeah. um, it becomes a very popular icon at the end of the uh, 10th century. Um, and um, you may notice that it has a certain similarity to a cross. Um, in fact, it begins to be worn and it becomes common in graves and is placed on the, on the sort of the breast of um, buried Vikings. Um, you know they're pagan rather than Christian if they have it there. But it's, it's worn as an amulet and then it's worn hanging down and like a sort of like a the handle of it and a little ring on the end that attaches to a necklace. So it's worn that way. And when they show it on the, in the, in the stone, it's upright because he's holding it. But it's often the, the, the other way, um, simply because it, it references a sort of that amulet worn. It begins to be used extensively, we find it in the late 10th century, when Christians begin using wearing crucifixes. And so it becomes a sort of a pagan response to the intrusion of this new religion. It says, no, 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 I'm not gonna take this, this new Christianity. I'm staying with Odin and Thor. I'm, I'm with the home team. I'm, I'm not with these Germans and English coming in here. And so, so to demonstrate that, they, they began wearing the, the hammer on the way. So it was, there was a stone that has been found in Denmark, it, and, it, and it has carved, it's a, uh, um, a stone for making, a mold for making uh, amulets. And it, there are two cross shapes, 
carved into it and one hammer shape in the middle. Uh, and so the smith who makes these could go around and make, if you want a new crucifix, he'll make a crucifix for you. If you want a hammer, he'll make a hammer for you. He's a businessman. He's going to sell whatever people want to buy. And, and, and the archaeologist, when he found this, he says, well, this is very interesting. And maybe this tells us the score at the time. Christians two, pagans one. Since there was one hammer and there were two crosses on this. It was his little joke, but it could well have been. Yes, sir? Kind of curious, uh, with the Vikings at being accepting of other cultures and compromise and having a global perspective, and oftentimes today we've seen Viking symbols co-opted by white nationalism and things like that. Kind of curious on your perspective on that. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, but it, it, it goes back, uh, it's not just now with the, with the nationalist right-wing extremists uh, in Scandinavia and Europe. Um, it was uh, very common in uh, the 1930s, 20s and 30s in Germany. Um, Heinrich Himmler was fascinated by the Aryan Viking past um, and uh, in fact had numerous excavations going in various places, including Norway when the Germans occupied there. Uh, looking for these ancient traces. He was fascinated by the, this, this. So it became part of Nazi mythology, um, and I think a lot of it has its remnants in that um, uh, today. Um, this ultra-nationalism that, uh, that is sort of hitting us all uh, everywhere, in our own country included, uh, but is, is uh, Unfortunately, it's prominent in, in Europe as well. Um, um, the election, recent election in, uh, in Finland suggests that uh, maybe there's a weakening of it, of the nationalist party there. Um, it's, there's nothing we can do about the symbols, like one of the symbols they use is a symbol for, uh, a runic symbol for um, heritage, family. And they've co-opted that as one of the symbols. They just simply use these, and it's unfortunate, but it shouldn't be seen as being sort of negative. Uh, we can't lump the Vikings or this historical cultural tradition in with that. They are simply using it, stealing it, and making it sort of for their own purposes <coughs> and reshaping it for their purposes. I think recognizing it for what it is and we can deal with it. Yeah. Kind of going back to the subject of uh, religion, especially like Christianity and um, Norse beliefs. So in, in some other cultures, especially Rome, we see the transition between uh, uh, pagan beliefs and Christianity actually going quite smoothly. Mm -hmm. For example, um, Christ being sort of seen in a symbol of soul and victus, so you could really do like a one-to-one -one comparison there. Actually, the Christian, the Christian missionaries were readily uh, allowed to be accepted, and unless they made nuisance of themselves. There is one Thangrand who goes to Iceland, and he, he destroys some images, and he, and he, um, he actually killed uh, somebody who was taunting him. This is a Christian missionary. And the Icelanders threw him out of the country, put him on a boat, and said, get out of here. Um, but by and large, they allowed them to proselytize. Um, and there was a s relatively smooth transition once the kings became Christian and everybody else sort of followed along and when you were required, that's sort of the tradition that the, the ruler, the, the religion of the ruler is the religion of the people. Um, there were fights between, between uh, pagans and Christians uh, from time to time. Um, there were threats of civil war in Iceland uh, and then a decision made by the all thing that uh, rather than fight and have a civil war, we will, must all have one religion. And a pagan law speaker proclaimed that religion should be Christianity. He understood it was the wave of the future. Everybody in Europe was becoming Christian. And we see this transition. There, the old beliefs, the, the gods, where do these
these gods go in this new religion? How can they be absorbed? The easiest way to make this transition is to bring these pagan deities and the traditions into Christianity, into the rituals of, of the church. The church is smart enough to do that. They build their churches on places where there had been pagan temples before. This is a holy place. We are simply the current residents, right? We're God, the Christian God is now greater than the pagan gods. In the iconography in Scandinavia, we have several representations of um, Christian saints. The Skog tapestry, S-K-O-G, tapestry, shows uh, three saints, um, uh, Scandinavian saints, uh, Ola, Knut, and Eric, the patron saint of Norway, Denmark, and uh, uh, Sweden. Eric of Sweden, Knut of, uh, Knut of Denmark, Eric of, uh, of Sweden, and Olaf of Norway. And they are shown as, uh, as uh, Christian uh, saints. Uh, but these Christian saints uh, are actually Norse gods. Because Saint Olaf is shown with a hammer, Thor's hammer. Um, and uh, he's known for his sword, not his hammer, but he's holding a hammer. Eric is, is a, a saint who is holding a, a sheath of wheat, fertility god, right? And then um, the third, uh, Knut, uh, I think it's uh, Knut or Eric, has a single eye, and he's Odin. So you've got Odin, Thor, and Frey, the trinity of Norse gods, being depicted as saints of the Christian church. So they've simply uh, incorporated them. Some of the aspects of the pagan religion the church could accept as um, um, folklore, and people could still believe it, and they didn't threaten the church. The pagan deities threatened the church. They had to be given a special place in the Christian tradition. So they were made, characteristics with them were, were um, given to uh, Christian saints. Saint Olaf becomes a Christian saint. He's a Viking warrior, a Viking king, who is seen as a martyr and a saint. He's the, he proclaims saint just a few years after his death in 1030. So he's easy, he becomes a symbol for the Christianization of Scandinavia. But if you have the giants, where do they go? The bad guys and all of these different spirits, well, they end up going into folklore and folk tradition. They're not incorporated into the church because they're not a threat to the church. And so, the, so what becomes of the giants? The enemies of the gods in pagan tradition, mythology. They become trolls. The trolls in the mountains. The little trolls, spirits and water spirits and rock spirits. But the great big mountain trolls, they're, are, are, are they, they're these giants in, who lived in the mountains anyway. It's perfect. So that, so that, you can still believe all this stuff and be a dedicated Christian. And the symbolism is there, and the association is there, and it's easy. It took several hundred years to make the tradition. The Swedish historian wrote that um, the conversion from paganism to Christianity in Sweden took 500 years from around the year 1000 to around the year 1500. And then they realized they'd made a terrible mistake. And they became Lutheran. <laughs> so they're Catholic for 500 years, but oh, so we didn't mean it. It's his little joke, but it's a long process. And it works if you're able to incorporate, if you're able to assimilate, and find the images and use them. And the church was very good at that. OK? Well, thank you again. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Jeffrey. And thank you for